Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. We're joined by the Twitter team once again, and we're discussing their paper, GNNs as gradient flows. And sorry for missing the first minute of the recording that's coming up, but um, we didn't do too much. So I think the, the contributions and everything should be covered. Let's go. Right. Is one sorry form of, um, it's fine. Um, gradient flow equations we consider in our paper that looks quite familiar, right? It's like, you know, you have a message passing matrix, uh, sort of a GCN type of term. We have a source term, we have an update independent of the graph, sort of like graph sage behavior. And we can also activate these equations with pointwise nonlinearities and preserve the same interpretation, right? But the point is more can be done in terms of choice of energy families, right? And then the final point is, Generally, gradient flows, like in, the, in physics or, or in geometry, they, they sort of put constraints in your model, like in your dynamical systems, and which usually result in like better inductive biases and reduced number of parameters. So you reduce the degrees of freedom, but hopefully in a meaningful way so that the, the sort of resulting framework may be efficient or more efficient. But then the other side of the coin of, of, this, of this sort of uh, framework is that we kind of go quite into a deep analysis of the role of the channel mixing in, in MPNNs and, you know, from the spectral point of view, right? So I'm summarizing here just to prepare you to what you'll see later, um, some of the main points of, of this theoretical analysis. So the first one is like this channel mixing W has sort of the ability sort of to steer the diffusion away from trivial steady states and in particular, magnify the high frequencies thanks to its negative eigenvalues. Um, and in fact, you can literally interpret the channel mixing as a potential that sort of can um, induce attraction or repulsion along edges. And you know, people that work on graph neural networks already would recognize this to be possibly beneficial depending on the underlying homophily of the graph. Um, there's also some, uh, I think, better understanding of the role of the residual connection from the point of view of the channel mixing, right? So for example, something like that, um, always smoothing results in literature were of course already existing, but they usually sort of look at um, the channel mixing by requiring the singular values of the channel mixing matrices to be sufficiently small uh, in terms of spec generalized spectral gap of the graph, so to speak. Uh, but usually these analyses were are for naive GCNs, meaning that they, they never considered the, the role of the residual connection. Um, but our results, they sort of show that the spectrum of the channel needs in, in some way can effectively be more powerful if we do have the residual connection. Uh, but sometimes even if we do have the residual connection, the channel mixing may not be enough if, for example, its spectrum can only induce attraction, right? Um, there's also like a slightly subtler problem um, that will be the first part of our talk effectively, which will be, which essentially is addressing the instance of the global scale um, when analyzing like the smoothing properties of a genet. So usually people say something like, oh, but if the Dirichlet energy is going to infinity, then for sure we are not over smoothing. In fact, we might be over separating or something along these lines. But the reality is like you actually have to look a little bit more in detail into what is the driving term What's, what's the term that's sort of um, uh, growing up the fastest? Because most of the times you may still do some over smoothing effectively. You're just looking at the wrong scale. So uh, this is the overview. And hopefully now we can go to, uh, into like the um, uh, actual paper and presentation. So just a slide to recap some notations. We have an undirected graph. We have adjacency in diagonal matrices and we have a normalized rescaling of the adjacency or everyone that has looked at a GCN paper now knows what that means. And we have the Laplacian operator, right? And because of the choice of our symmetrically normalized adjacency, we can write the Laplacian as just identity minus A bar. And here, just to recap what this normalization means, effectively, you end up with a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix where its eigenvalues or AKA graph frequencies can be ordered from zero to the spectral radius rho delta, which will always be a number smaller or equal than two. 
And then you have the eigenvectors phi delta L of the uh, graph Laplacian. Um, so if you have a but signal on a can graph- we, Can we go, go, go back one slide and just recap, recap quickly? So this Laplacian is uh, acting on signals, which maybe are just vectors, uh, which yeah. Yeah, are just vectors. And we act on these signals by multiplying them with the Laplacian. Of course, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Um, um, right, so in fact, about that, we have a signal on a graph or a feature, and you can think of that of, as, uh, for example, a sunny temperature, uh, you know, at each node of the graph, and then you can represent this as an n-dimensional vector, right? So for example, you can write this vector down with respect to the basis of uh, orthonormal vectors of the Lagrange population, right? So this is the decomposition here, and there is a very classical quantity on graphs, of course, on continuous spaces as well, which is called Dirichlet energy. And this quantity is a function that, or technically is a functional, but since we are in the discrete world, this is just a function from Rn to R. And the idea is it quantifies the smoothness of a signal on a graph. So you, you give me your signal, which is an n-dimensional vector, and then the Dirichlet energy is effectively computing the uh, uh, norm, the L2 norm squared of the deviation of the signal along each edge, right? And you can re rewrite this compactly as an inner product with respect to the Laplacian. This is not super important here, but of course there are better ways of writing this down. What's also interesting is that you can see from the last term on this equation that effectively the projections of your signal on the lower frequency second vectors of the Laplacian determine the smoothness of a signal. So as you can see, eigenvectors to the Laplacian associated with lower frequencies are smooth, and eigenvectors to the Laplacian associated with higher frequencies are not smooth. And this will be clear also in the next slide. Um, just a notation, this, uh, the, basically the, we are taking the L2 norm of the gradient of a feature along an edge, right? Um, so let me give you also a rough picture of something quite classical in you know, signal theory on graphs, which is low pass versus high pass, right? So suppose you have a dynamical process on a graph. So you, now you have your signal or feature that changes in time. And now for each time you can decompose this signal over the uh, Laplacian eigenbasis. Now, if the high frequency components, so the, the projections of the signal with respect to the eigenvectors of the Laplacian with higher frequencies decay fast enough in time, you are effectively smoothing the signal out, right? So this is sort of a blurring phenomenon. Um, if instead the opposite happens, then you act as a high pass filter. And so you sort of sharpen the signal. And this picture on, at the bottom, for example, is sort of showing you that it, as you increase, sort of you move from left to right, you move from the uh, smoothest eigenvector of the Laplacian, and then you start, you know, increasing the frequency, meaning that you start looking at signals that are less and less smooth. So less and less sort of constant over the graph, right? So this is a very rough picture, but the, what I wanna do in the next sort of five minutes or 10 maybe is trying to give you a bet better definitions or better like uh, a more precise formalization of this low versus high pass that might be useful when we analyze genens as well. Um, so remember that we had our digital energy that measures smoothness of a signal, right? Now, if, suppose you wanna minimize the Dirichlet energy, meaning that given an input signal F0, you wanna sort of take the smoothest possible signal you can construct out of F0. And then the canonical way of doing that would be you take infinitesimal steps in the direction of steepest descent of the energy, right? And if you do that, you, you find what is arguably the, the uh, most important equation on graphs, which is the heat equation, right? So the heat equation is just the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy, meaning that it's a differential equation where you evolve your signal in the direction of minus the gradient of the energy, right? But of course, because of what, how we can write the energy, this is just minus the Laplacian of the solution. So it's a gradient flow, meaning that since the solution is effectively minimizing our energy, the energy, of course, decreases in time. So becomes the solution becomes smoother and smoother. And in fact, if we let the dynamics run for too long, 
then we are converging to a steady state, which is quite trivial because it will be in the kernel of the Laplacian, right? And because of the choice of the Laplacian we made before, the steady state we converge to is a multiple of this square root of the degree vector, meaning that any pair of nodes in the graph with the same degree will converge to the same representation. So of course, if you have something that blurs the signal, like a low pass dynamics, like the heat equation, if you let it run for too long, features become indistinguishable. And this is not great. Um, very quickly, this can be generalized, of course, up to this point we've, we've talked about scalar signals, but this can be generalized to higher dimensions. Of course, we just replace the L2 norm with L2 norm of d-dimensional vectors. If we have d-dimensional features, nothing changes here. And I just want to very briefly touch on this. We won't have, I guess, at least in the span of the first hour of the presentation time to talk about the Kronecker product or, or its formalism, but any conversation that we may have afterwards, uh, we can talk about this more in detail. But let me just say that throughout the paper, most of the theory builds on every time you have a matrix differential equation, you vectorize the solution so that basically you using, using the Kronecker product, you can transform a matrix OD to a vector OD. And you can write this down, everything becomes more compact and, and much easier to analyze, right? But let's not spend too much time on this now. So I gave you before like an overview of what, what's um, low pass dynamics versus high pass dynamics, right? Now, I wanna go a little bit more in detail because this is the problem of global scale I was in, hinting at um, in the overview of the contributions. So suppose you have this system of the graph on the graph. So effectively you have a two dimensional features on the graph and then you're acting only on the X coordinate, you're freezing the Y coordinate. Okay, that's not crucial. But if you look at basically at these two figures top and bottom, they are effectively representing the same dynamics so basically you have the axis here that goes from zero to 40. This is the uh, time of the evolution. Um, but what's different is of course that you have an exponential explosion in the first plot, uh, which is not occurring on the second plot, but this is the same dynamics. The only difference is that the plot on the bottom at each time we are normalizing the solution. So what I want to emphasize here is that Although we have an exponential behavior, so everything is growing up in terms of norm, for example, the, the, the way it's growing up, it's, it's in, a, in a way like the, the, the term that is growing up the fastest is the smoothest one. And in fact, once we normalize the solution, we converge to two representations here at the bottom, which represent the only two degree information we have on the graph, which is two and three. So any node with degree two will converge here, any node with degree three will converge here. So effectively, this is the canonical over smoothing problem we have when in the limit, we only have degree information. But I want the, the take home message of this slide is resetting the scale by normalizing the solution matters in terms of figuring out whether we are effectively over smoothing or not. So this is why we introduced this definition in the paper, which we refer to as LFD, which effectively means that if you have a dynamical system on a graph and the Dirichlet energy of the normalized solution is going to zero, then you say that the dynamics is dominated by the low frequency. So this is a smoothing process. And one actually checked that that makes sense because you can effectively show that up to subsequences, when this is satisfied, you are effectively converging to a steady state, which is in the kernel of the Laplacian. So a very trivial, uninteresting steady state, exact as for the heat equation. So LFT, everything is smoothing. And if we let it run for too long, we get over smoothing. Of course, we also have the opposite behavior. So the Dirichlet energy of the normalized solution is always bounded from above by the largest eigenvalue of the Laplacian over two. And one can check that if the uh, Dirichlet energy of the normalized solution approaches this upper bound uh, as you let the dynamics run for too long, then you have a dynamics that is dominated by the high frequency. So this, this is the very opposite of a smoothing behavior. And in fact, once again, you can check that when this is, when this is the case, you converge to the eigenspace of the Laplacian associated with highest frequency. So now you have these two characterization, LFT and HFT, which are basically describing two very 
sort of uh, and sort of opposite behaviors. One is smoothing, and in fact, if you let it run for too long, you you sit in the kernel of the Laplacian. One is sharpening. If you let it run for too long, you you convert to the highest frequency eigenvector. Um, and of course, this slide is sort of to highlight that on the left, this is the same plot we had before, but on the right, if you now have a dynamics that is like HFD and you normalize the solution, you converge to a one-dimensional space here, which is basically the highest frequency eigenvector of the Laplacian. You can see that if you start from a graph that is sort of purposefully colored with uh, in a heterophilic way, highest frequency may be more, much more valuable than uh, low frequencies for separability. Um, so I trust that people like, in, you know, you know what these terms mean, but let me just say, we are most of the time thinking of a node classification setting. We have a training set. We want to predict labels on a test set. And we use homophily and heterophily to mean that in the first case, neighbors, often share labels. So labels are smooth and that everything that is a low pass is in a way good. Heterophily is the opposite. So labels are not smooth. Um, and therefore, if you do something like a low pass, like a smoothing process, that would be bad, right? Um, the dual perspective, of course, is uh, homophily means sort of short range relations matter. Heterophily means long range relations are also important. Now, we have, before we sort of go through the gradient flow framework, um, let me recall what GCN, what we know about GCN. So this is a GCN layer. We have a message passing matrix. We have channel mixing matrices, which are this W here. Um, some, something we know about GCN, in, both empirically and sort of theoretically, is like GCN has a poor performance on uh, heterophilic graphs. Um, and there is a degradation of the performance when increasing depth or um, AKA over smoothing. Um, and when I also recap in this theorem by Kai and Wang, what effectively is known about GCN before our paper. So we know that if the singular values of the channel mixing matrices are small enough, so smaller than the spectral gap, then the Dirichlet energy of a GCN solution after T layers is actually converging to zero exponentially. So the take a message of this result is if the singular values of the channel mixing are controlled, then the solution GCN becomes increasingly smoother, which means we sort of explains why GCN kind of succeed with automophily, but fail with heterophily. And if you let GCN run for too long, we converge to the kernel of the Laplacian, which is everything is basically the same. The only thing we can dis distinguish is degree, best case scenario. So this is one slight recap of over smoothing in literature um, for genetics, right? So some questions are, what if the singular values are not bounded, right? Can we sort of require more structure on W? What is the interpretation of the channel mixing? And if there is sort of like a minimal requirement for graph convolutional framework to, for example, be HFT, meaning to magnify the high frequency and in fact induce a sharpening behavior, which we sort of suspect to be beneficial or required, in fact, if we have a trophy, right? So the key ingredient in, in, in our paper is the following. So we know that it's now kind of well established that like residual neural networks mimic differential equations, right? They can be thought of as approximation of differential equation. Now, no, differential equations, like they model basically any, almost any phenomenon out there. But there is a special class of differential equations that are particularly studied both in physics and you know, in, in geometry in general, which are gradient flows. So these are the kind of differential equations where the ODE is the gradient, or I should say minus the gradient of an energy. So what happens is we are, the dynamics is actually minimizing some energy uh, uh, upstairs. And the idea is gradient flows are much easier to analyze and sort of study compared to the general dynamical system setting, because we know that we are minimizing an energy. So for example, we know most likely what we are converging to or what is the asymptotic behavior, what is the driving term in the dynamics and so on. And the key question in our paper is, what if sort of we parameterize an energy rather than the message passing neural network equations, 
So, and the idea is effectively is learning an energy that generalizes the Dirichlet energy so we can kind of find the right notion of smoothness for the problem. And then we take the uh, equations to be the gradient flow of this energy that we, we are learning. Okay. So, Honestly, you have a so question. Frances Francesco, isn't this um, like, why, why do we know that this is a good restriction sort of, but why um, instead of learning the dynamics, you said we now just learn in, or we design the energy and then take the uh, gradient with respect to that energy and let our features evolve according to that instead of um, having the being able to also capture a non gradient dynamics. Why, so, why would this be good to restrict our flexibility like this? Yeah, so that's a, so that's a good question. I think the, there are two answers I would give you. The first one is if you look out there, like in both classical and quantum physics, um, you don't have, like for example, classical mechanics, you don't have like any type of equation out there. You usually have a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian depending on the formalism. So there are actually constraints on the dynamics, but this is already quite flexible to describe anything out there. And when you move from classical to quantum, the Lagrangian becomes quantum, but there are always in physics functionals and most of the times in geometry too, that are sufficiently rich and powerful to model the dynamics. The, the question you're raising is the following. So and it does make sense. It's true that if you do follow a gradient flow, you may have restriction a priori on the sort of hypothesis space, so to speak. But the point is, uh, the sort of the price you're paying may be compensated in terms of the interpretation you get. And if if I get if I look at physics in general, I think the equations we have there are quite flexible enough to describe the universe. And most of the times, I, I would say always, arguably, there is an energy there. So why deep learning? Like I don't see generally like what we are that we are losing too much. By by making this 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 assumption, and in fact, in some way, the theoretical analysis we have after that can be interpreted as showing that even in this simple quadratic energy setting, you can recover convolutional networks on graphs that can be LFT, HFT, uh, and this sort of can be quite expressive already. Even in the simplest approach, you can go much more complicated with energy. And I don't like the the main answer for me is like. When you give me a gen n equation and then you add the piece in the equation, uh, in general you are more expressive, yes. But I don't. Most of the times I don't know what's going on because I, I, analyzing differential equations is quite hard. But now if you give me an energy and you add the piece in the energy, I know much better what this term would do because this term would drive the minimization process, right? This if and in fact, uh, I would say most of the times like gen n for molecules and stuff, you are you want to learn an an, an energy at the end of the day. So it's like, you, why not trying to bring the, sort of bridge the gap between, between what we're modeling physics and how we're trying to learn that, right? Just, just one point. Okay. The analogy as well as like the total, total variational methods from image processing from like the 90s noughties. So what they do is they, they define an energy. It was non-parametric at the time, but it describes the desirable properties of the solution. So you know, when you minimize the energy you get, so like the total variational methods is, you want to reduce the total variation within the boundary and then sharpen along the boundaries. So if you define your energy such that you satisfy those properties at the minima, you know that the gradient flow is explainable in, in those terms. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. In fact, like it um there's this like here, which was I was about to say next. And I want to emphasize that this this like is very synthetic but for anyone is interested in also what James is saying is like the actual one one of the motivations and in fact the starting point we had uh, in the appendix of the paper, we have much better explanation of what's this gap with, what's sort of this connection with image processing. And another way of seeing that is labor propagation. Like initially labor propagation was casted as a variational framework and where you had an energy, which was a digital energy. And then you had a fitting term, which was based on the supervised or sort of the available labels. And then you, you took the minimization of that to be your prediction. So um, labor propagation, image processing, most of the times energy seem to be way flexible enough and the price you're paying in terms of 
so to speak, expressivity is very much compensated by the fact that, I mean, energy are very powerful and they can, you know what's going on a bit better, okay? So I think I, uh, in general, like there's ample evidence outside deep learning in general and that that, that works. And this paper is, at least for the case of GNNs, maybe like the first one is try to argue in favor of, 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 you know, trying to think more about energy rather than equations. But we can, yeah, we can of course go on uh, after that as well. But that's of course yeah, a, a very, I, I a still very have point. some questions left there, but maybe we'll keep those for for later. Okay. Um, right. So I'm checking the time. So let me see. I'm gonna go with this slide a bit briefly, but of course, uh, if we can talk about this later, but the appendix in, in that paper, the first section has all the details here, but. Essentially, we have this question, right? Okay, let's parameterize an energy rather than equations. But then sort of the question then becomes, what kind of energy, right? And this is where like also the uh, sort of what James was saying comes into play, right? One looks first historically at what was the case for image processing, right? In before the deep learning era, where there, there were PDEs, right? And most of these PDEs were variational, meaning that these PDEs minimize an energy. And we can follow the same approach for graphs. And what we end up getting essentially in the simplest case is a Dirichlet energy weighted by some uh, essentially constant metric H in feature space. So what you're doing, is, if you look at the last term of this equation is you are still computing the L2 norm of the gradient of the feature along each edge, but you're weighting this gradient with some W, right? Now, what it turns out is that if you take the gradient flow of this energy, you get an, an equation like this one here in the proposition. And this equation, basically, you have only two types of behaviors. If the gradient along an edge, which is a d-dimensional vector, uh, you look at the projection into the kernel of W transpose W, this projection stays invariant along the flow. So this would be an integral of the equation, now, which is also important in terms of the interpretability. But everything else is shrinking to zero exponentially fast. So basically, everything is getting closer to each other along an edge, except for the projections in the kernel. But you can never be less smooth than your initial condition. You can never pull things apart along an edge, which we know might be desirable operations. For example, if you have a trophy or if you want to do more complicated things, right? So this energy is kind of not good enough, right? So it's sort of like a smoothing type of energy. We we may have over smoothing if we have zero kernel and essentially we can do repulsion. So we can do attraction, we can keep things invariant, but we can do repulsion. So the next step or the next ingredient in our construction of an energy is looking at in introducing this, this repulsion piece. Um, and the way we do it essentially is like, again, I leave some of the details out, but uh, we, we start from the energy we had above, we modify it a little, so then now we have an energy that takes feature and depending on matrices W and omega, which are symmetric, it computes two terms. So the first one is independent of the graph and it is effectively an external field on in feature space. The second one depends on the graph because you have the connectivity via the uh, adjacent CA. And you can see it's basically an inner product between Fi and Fj sort of uh, weighted by W. So it's a sort of pairwise energy along each edge and W is the potential that controls the interaction along edges. Now, why, I mean, what is this energy doing, right? So first thing, we can compute the gradient flow of this energy and you can now see that the equation are very familiar, right? It's like, this is sort of essentially like a convolutional uh, operation on graph. And the first piece is sort of like a graph stage type of operation, which is independent of the graph. But okay, yeah, we have differential equation, but what is going on in terms of the energy at the energy level, right? So W controls the pairwise interaction. So let's decompose W now into a positive definite part and a negative definite part because W is symmetric. So we can always do that, okay? Um, then if we do that, we can rewrite the energy as follows. And if you ignore the first term, this is essentially what the... It's a gap between omega and w, but it's independent of the graph structure because we are only summing over nodes. We're not summing over edges. 
these two terms here governed by um, theta plus and theta minus are the ones that matter. So remember we have an energy and everything we are solving is minimizing this energy. So the W here now encodes attraction via its positive eigenvalues because the term theta plus times the gradient are decreasing along the edge. So basically this is effectively what we had before, right? But it's also in, in, inducing repulsion via its negative eigenvalues because this term here on the right-hand side has to decrease, but since there is a minus sign, effectively we are asking theta minus times the gradient to increase as L2 norm over each edge. So the bottom line, the, the key message here is the following. I haven't looked yet at equations, but it, by looking at the energy, I can already tell that W is controlling edgewise repulsion and attraction by its, neg by its negative and positive eigenvalues respectively. So this is the power sort of the energy. You know that since the dynamics is minimizing the energy, you know the sort of the things you are learning, because of course, W is one of the main objects you want to learn by a propagation, is entering the dynamics in a very special way. And it's giving you this type of operation. You can do attraction along an edge, which might be desirable of homophily, but you can do also repulsion along an edge, which could be desirable if you have a trophy. And then you can go on and prove what I've just claimed. And this proposition is sort of like a high level version of what I, of, of the result. But in the paper, there's like all the quantitative statement, very precise, you have the rate of convergence and so on. But the key thing is these dynamics will be, will not only avoid oversmoothing, but in fact, it will be a sharpening dynamics, meaning that uh, it will be uh, driven by the high frequencies if you have enough negative eigenvalues of the channel mixing W. So the channel mixing, which is a potential that effectively induces either attraction or repulsion, and so either induces a smoothing phenomenon or avoids oversmoothing and induces high frequency dominated behavior by learning the spectrum. So the spectrum of W actually matters a lot. Um, and this is also an important slide, yeah? Yeah, sorry. Uh, can you go uh, two slides back or three slides back? Um, here? No. Uh, the one before? Yeah, here? so here. No, the one after, actually. Yeah. This one? Um, this one, this one, yes. Um, so here you make the you, you make the analogy that uh, the energy EW is equivalent to the potential energy, whether the other one is equivalent to the external field being applied on a graph. Can you um, can you explain a bit more this uh, why, why you do this analogy? No, the reason is I'm using these words not in a specific way, but I want to emphasize that the omega and W bit, they control two very different things. So omega is unaware of the graph structure. Omega only sees nodes. It doesn't see, it acts on each node, but it doesn't see edges, right? It doesn't act on the edges. But W instead is basically telling you how uh, particles or features along edges, they interact with each other. So this is why like W is pairwise, in other words, it acts on the edges, but omega is independent of the connectivity, it only sees nodes. This is the main analogy. Uh, this is the main idea I'm trying to convey here. Uh, I think you're muted if you're trying to say something. Yeah, sorry. If you yeah. Can you go on the next slide? Next yeah. slide, yes. Yeah, okay. So here, when we look into that, um, Might be easier to find the one before the factorization. Okay, maybe. I think I don't know if you want if you're if you want like the at the energy level what I was just saying you can can be sort of seen by by yeah. the fact that the omega piece you you see that like it's you are summing over the nodes you are you are not looking at edges it's like independent of the graph connectivity, but the the dub instead you're very much looking at the energy uh, at the uh, pairwise interactions. Yeah. So can this we, is... um, 
like uh, can we think of this first uh, variable instead of being like the energy of an external field uh could it be equivalent um could could we think of it as like the speed of the nodes where like uh, the the kinetic energy of the nodes basically um not yet because we are not taking the first derivative in time but yeah that then if, if because this is fi it's not fi dot so technically it's not yet a kinetic energy it's more like mm -hmm. you can think of a positional you can think of basically let's say let's say there is a positional underlying field that acts on the positions so you it acts on the position on each node it doesn't depend on whether there are nodes interacting with each other or not so one thing is a positional like for example if there was like i don't know things of electro electromagnetic field things that's like there's a source at the origin so to speak that acts on each node separately yeah. but then the w is how the charges of the node interact with each other via the graph connectivity yeah the only issue i have like here is that you don't necessarily have a notion of position for your nodes right or the, does the it doesn't take into account the, the structure so, no 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 no, no. I, I you're right i'm, I'm using here i'm looking at yeah. the most possibly yeah. general graphic so i'm looking at and yeah, sure. i'm thinking of features as positions in, in dimension d of course i'm not talking about actual positions yes sure so uh the actually not positions we should more be more talk about like degrees of freedom like like the the sort of the coordinates of the system like in the sort of lagrangian yeah. formalism yeah okay um so it could be okay well maybe maybe it's difficult to make analogies with physics so um anyways i just wanted to see like if we could clarify why these analogies are made so that uh it's easier to to understand like where it comes from compared to like traditional physics knowledge um but if you, if you if you look at the bottom equation you see i see omega so if omega was like a diagonal scalar matrix i see omega as a dampening yeah. so if f gets too big you take a bit of f off it's like a dampening term so it acts no plus um I, I didn't hear you very well did you say that omega is kind of a damp damping yeah so if you look yes if you look at the, the bottom equation if f gets too big you take a bit of f off so omega is like a dampening term okay okay that makes sense yeah sure um right so where were we so okay so w attraction uh by both second values and repulsion by negative second values so i think we have to Oh yeah, uh, this is just one slide I want to emphasize. So what's interesting is if you take the gradient flow and you um, activate it with a pointwise nonlinearity that satisfies the condition of the result. So like for example, ReLU, TANH, ARCTAN, like it's a very general class. Then the energy you have still decreases along the solution. So what it means is you can, also, you can still activate pointwise equations um, but the interpretation of this potential as inducing attraction repulsion along edges persist, even though technically now you're not a gradient flow. So you're not losing much of expressive power here, but you can preserve the, the interpretation. Remember here, but James is gonna in a second uh, talk about that more. The key requirement is the matrices that appear have to be symmetric for the interpretation to stand because everything is a gradient flow of a quadratic energy if, you're, if you have symmetry. Um, I'm going to skip about, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, let's say, um, because I, the conversation can go on later, but I want to say two points here. The first one in the paper, you're going to find this result, which essentially says exist some of the existing, um, continuous models, like continuous general models will fail to be HFD. So the, the property of magnifying high frequency it's not that granted and in fact most of these models will over smooth um i i will skip that the second uh thing i will be um skipping and but james so we can talk about the discrete case and then the evaluation is this one so in the real world we are not continuous we discretize and the, the okay there's a typo here i apologize for that but the in the paper, there's also this main result, which effectively says that when we discretize the continuous equation with Euler step and so on, 
you can still have the same interpretation of the channel mixing as inducing attraction and repulsion and via the positive and negative eigenvalues respectively. Something important that um, turns out, I mean, emerges when you look at the discrete equations is that if you drop the residual connection, then the channel mixing cannot help you. And in fact, you will always be dominated by the low frequencies, even though you have negative eigenvalues as large as you want. So the channel mixing becomes much, much less powerful if you drop the residual connection. And this will be confirmed later. So we can talk about these results more in detail, but I'm, I will now like um, leave uh, to James so he has time to sort of talk about what's next. Uh, I'm gonna mute myself as well. Um, Shall I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I can Excellent. find a way of muting myself. Oh, I can't share my screen. And it's, can you help? Uh, I can't share. Yeah, now you should be able to share your can't screen hear you either. because Francesco stopped. Oh, because I stopped. Is it possible? Uh, uh, if not, we'll use Francesco's. Uh, maybe now. Uh, no. Yeah, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. And I'll, I'll keep my you can, you can Yeah, okay. Um, I can also, I made, I made you a co host. Maybe I, it makes it work. Thanks. Yeah, no, we're just. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Do we have any questions while we're just doing this? Yeah, then uh, maybe. Is Francesco answering questions or are you answering questions? Uh, the yeah. Both of us, but maybe, yeah, um, okay. I mean, I, I want to say like, maybe if these are long questions, we should, maybe we could like uh, wait till James has gone through that. So maybe people are like, want to leave like in, 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 in like at the end of the, of the hour yeah. mark that they've seen some experiments and stuff and then we can have conversation. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, but maybe you can. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to quickly run through this. I guess this the architecture of the GNN. Uh, I'll go through some ablation studies in our final results table. So it should take about ten or fifteen minutes. Um, so first of all, our architecture, like many of these uh, continuous GNNs, what we do is we have an encoder block and a decoder block. So the encoder block will give you essentially an encoding of the raw features, which is the initial condition of the PDE. Uh, that will then use uh, an explicit Euler rollout. Um, so here we just, I think, yeah, you can see that from the first three terms of this expression. Uh, and then we'll use a decoder block, which will make the predictions based off the terminal state of the evolution. And now because we have a gradient flow, we have this extra restriction or requirement that our matrices omega and w are symmetric and shared across the layers. Um, I wanted to comment on the practicalities of the, there's a balancing act to play between the terminals, well, the asymptotic dynamics and the initial condition. So what Francesco kind of introduced is if you have low frequency dominant, dominated dynamics, every, fe every feature channel will converge to one, if we have a symmetrically normalized adjacency, they will converge to one over the degree. So you'll have a smoothing process. Conversely, if you have high frequency dynamics, every feature channel is going to converge to the highest uh, eigenvector of the graph Laplacian. Um, so what I've done here is I've written the vectorized form um, of, of our evolution equation. So what we do here is we stack. So say you have an N by D matrix, say we have X, Y, Z. You stack this into a vector column, and you can write you can write the expression for every every coordinate in that matrix in that vector as a linear combination of ODEs. So linear ODEs, where you can see we have the tensor product basis. So we have uh, yeah the, the the tensor product of uh, the eigenvectors of W and the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. But what also matters so there's two things that matter with this expression. You have the interaction between the eigenvalues of W and the graph Laplacian, 
and whether the product of these is either positive or negative. Uh, and then you also have the initial conditions of these linear system of ODEs. And because it's just an eigen decomposition, it's a projection onto this eigen basis. So whilst you might have terms that grow to dominate, either the highest or the lowest frequency eigenvector of the graft Laplacian, what also matters is how they project, how the initial condition projects onto those eigenvectors at the start of the evolution. So by choosing your integration time, if you choose a very long integration time, you're either going to converge to the highest or the lowest frequency of the graph Laplacian. If you choose a very short integration time, it'll be the encoder that matters. So what we do is we hyperparameter tune, hyper tune over T for each data set to find, find an optimal, optimal range. There's a, the trade-off of these, these two kind of interacting forces, let's say. Um, so just to remind ourselves of the energy that Francesco introduced earlier, we say if W has positive eigenvalues, then along that direction, along the eigen direction, you'll get attraction between two nodes along an edge. And if W has negative eigenvalues in that direction, you'll get repulsion along the edge. So for our ablation studies, we want to control, control the situation. So we want to say, well, let's focus on the, th the three kind of situations that we use. So first of all, we enforce symmetry by just doing the summation variant, which is W plus W transpose, but we don't have any control on the sign of the spectrum. And then we use either prod or neg prod, which are either positive or negative semi-definite, and they're signed eigenvalues, so they're either positive or negative eigenvalues. And then the third variant is what we call diagonally dominant. So here, just to describe it, the diagonal terms are some linear combination of the sum of the absolute value of the off-diagonal terms. So this is kind of like a way of like more sensitively learning the spectrum of W. So these are the variants that we use for the ablation studies that I'm going to show. Um, yeah, so just to remind ourselves about the claims that we're making in the paper, we say if there's positive eigenvalues, there's attraction, and this attraction means that we have low pass dynamics, which means we converge to the, the lowest frequency of the graph Laplacian. Conversely, if there's negative eigenvalues, we get repulsion and we have kind of a high, higher pass filter. And then there's the claim in the paper that's saying that the residual connection gives power to the spectrum. And if we don't have a residual connection, then independent of the spectrum of W, we'll have low frequency dynamics. Um, so in, in the ablation studies, we used the synthetic Cora data set from the H2 GCN paper. And that what it does is it samples Cora, but rewires the edges to give you different levels of homophily. You'll see on the next slide. And what we're claiming is, if it's very homophilic, then a low pass filter is good enough. So you can just kind of have a smoothing process. But if it's, if it's a heterophilic setting, then you need some higher pass filter or repulsion along the edges um, that we'll hopefully see here. So this first, you know, the first ablation study does exactly this. So the, the x-axis is the different uh, 11 uh, type, types of homophily. So 0, 10% up to 100%. Uh, and then for each of these models, we, we run with our restricted W to give us an accuracy. And there are there are three interesting areas of the graph. So the first is the, the purple and the green lines, which are not very well performing for in the heterophilic setting, um, but it's for two different reasons. So the green line is the prod, and we know prod has only positive eigenvalues, so it's only attractive. So in the regime where we're only attractive in a heterophilic setting, we get bad performance. And then similarly with GCN, which is the purple line, we don't have a, it's not residual GCN, so we don't have a residual connection. So irrespective of the eigenvalues of the channel mixing matrix in GCN, it's always going to give a low pass filter. So again, for heterophilic performance, it's bad. Um, next is, uh, if you look at the, the orange line, the neg prod, we only have negative eigenvalues there. It's not a very good architecture, and no, nowhere in the paper do we claim you just want repulsion along the edges. Um, but it is interesting to see an uptick for very extreme levels of heterophily. It does start to outperform uh, prod, which is the positive eigenvalues. But I guess most interesting are the blue and red lines, so diagonally dominant and sum, where we don't control the signs of the spectrum. So you can have a mixture of positive and negative eigenvalues. And you can see across 
the different levels of homophily, we get we get better performance. And obviously heterophily, heterophily is harder, which is why the performance is lower in general. Uh, now there's a bit to unpack on this second ablation, but bear with me, we'll do it. So what, we, what we've done here is we've used the prediction homophily to try and understand if given these different regimes, the dynamics can give you a solution that matches the homophily of the underlying solution. So there's two types of markers. So the dots is the decoder applied directly to the encoder. So it, it's like a prediction without doing any evolution through the PDE. And then the crosses is the decoder applied to the terminal state. So that, that is just the prediction that the GNN would make. So along each of these verticals, going from the dot to the cross is the evolution through the layers of the GNN. Uh, again, I wanted to point out three interesting parts of the chart. So first of all, sorry about the readability, but you have to believe me, the blue and the red crosses. So the terminal state of diagonally dominant and sum, which has both positive and negative eigenvalues, kind of tracks along the y equals x axis. So that means the, di the dynamics are free enough to learn a, a homo homophily of the prediction that matches the true underlying label, which I guess you would call a necessary requirement to have good performance. Um, and then secondly, if you look at prod, which is the green guys, as you go from the green dot to the green cross, you always go upwards, which means the homophily of the prediction increases as, as you do the evolution, which again is as expected. You have a smoothing process. Uh, and conversely, for the neg prod, where you have negative eigenvalues, you go downwards. So it means you sharpen your signal because of the repulsion along the edges. Uh, yeah. And this guy is just a quick runtime ablation. Uh, we compare against GGCN, which is uh, one of our competitive heterophilic baselines. Um, but more so, we, we actually show in this, if you focus on these bottom lines here, that um, graph or our instance of graph is actually faster than GCN. So GCN is this top, let's say, brown line, and graph is this bottom blue line. And the, the kind of three sources of why graph runs quicker than GCN. The first of all is we have an encoder. So you get dimensionality reduction before any edgewise convolutions. You share the weights, so you have less parameters. And also graph doesn't require any nonlinear activations between each step. So there's less operations. So it's, yeah. So I guess from the previous slide, what we're saying is graph is a very fast and simple framework that gives you enough, let's say, expressivity to get good performance. And this is kind of reflected in the results table. So I guess the bottom two are different versions of graph uh, described in the paper. Um, but I guess the key takeaway is it's competitive with our heterophilic baselines, but we've shown we're, we're simple and we're faster than GCN, um, which is, yeah, I, I guess I didn't want to dwell too much, but yeah, that, that's the point. We're, we're a very lightweight, simple model. And the, the other thing, I think in our paper, we restricted our hidden dimension to 64 as well, because we really wanted to make it super simple. Um, so conclusions, I think we're almost done. Yep, so there's two interpretations of the gradient flow framework. The first is we have this energy interpretation where we know we're minimizing a learnable energy and that energy gives us either attraction or repulsion along edges. Um, and the second interpretation is a lot of, in the paper, there's a lot of spectral analysis and it gives you asymptotic results um, to do with the, com the interaction between the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian and the channel mixing matrix which is, I guess, also to this third point, um, you, get, you get some bonus mathematical results in the paper, which extends a lot of the asymptotic GNN results of over-smoothing and Dirichlet energy to include the channel mixing matrix. Um, and yeah, finally, so the instance of graph that we, we've shown is very close to GCN, but explainable, it performs fast and explainably well on heterophilic data sets. Uh, and final slide, three obvious extensions for graph. Um, everything we considered so far, W is static. So it's just a static bilinear form, but we could introduce some heterogeneity. So that would be the making W dependent on features or 
positional encodings or, or time. Um, and then second point, we sh we've shown that we have dynamics that either converge to the lowest or the highest frequency. What about if we can hit the middle of the frequency in the limit? Then you wouldn't have to cut off the integration time. You could just integrate to infinity and potentially converge to an interesting solution. Um, and then, yeah, as Francesco kind of said at the start, because we have this energy formulation you can do what the physicists do and encode lots of interesting properties into into the energy that you know when you minimize them uh, you get the like well-behaved solutions so i think there's a few like if you include mass then you can have second order dynamics you can put boundary conditions in your energy these these kind of things um so that's me done i think uh, i'll scoot over and let francesco yeah let's use still this laptop um okay so thank you yeah thanks a lot uh i'm not sure about um i haven't seen, yeah we haven't seen the chat um oh, uh, ben already take care of that first one yeah okay uh in addition to recording oh yeah the slides yeah of course um okay so i i think it's not the first time present this paper and every time I'm like, that's the time we will have the chance to talk about Siri. But every time <laughs> this like <laughs> feels rushed. But so I think it's a good time. Like if you have any questions, especially I think Anas, you 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 were about to ask one, I guess, before. Uh yeah, it's conversation. Uh about it. Okay. Would you would you say it's a fair statement um if we say that? Uh, like if we or maybe the the main thing of approaching gnns in your way is that now if we um, parameterize an energy instead of uh, um, instead of the direct dynamics instead of directly parameterizing the dynamics this way we get more control or it is easier to build in our prior knowledge about the, the data that we uh, want to process I think that um, so that would definitely be a fair statement. At least that's the main motivation as far, at least for me. Um there are deeper questions that sort of follow up from that. And some of these, some of the things that I can say, some of the things I cannot say, mostly because I'm I still in the process of understanding them. But in in some way, like in terms of inducing a prior or something like that, you're you're right. I think that's the main um somehow it is the main point and it's like also like you know for example you could look at the spectrum of the channel mix in them and this interpretation and let's say you have no understanding of the graph you you you, you were looking at beforehand you you do some training you look at the learnable weights and now you see that the spectrum of w has a very specific behavior and you would kind of you can say then something about based on the spectrum whether the dynamics was mostly attractive or not this is you can say this so this is a consequence of as you are saying the more control you get from this approach but the second question is much subtler but to me also more interesting and this is um, hopefully we will address this in the future is what do, from from a deep learning point of view um, what do you gain from learning an energy rather than equations is this actually equivalent or not because the point is like um in the form this is why i keep emphasizing that uh this is by no means the most general family of energy you can look at and of course james also emphasized that at the end by saying this is a static potential and so on so there is a sort of like an underlying um hopefully underlying message here that controlling energy hopefully means controlling stationary states so that and we all know that in, in deep learning there's all this problem with like especially on graphs like of integration time when you stop how you stop and and so on so ideally it would be really nice if you, if you have like a functional whose stationary states are good enough for the classification whatever task you have on the graph not level or graph level and therefore it's just a matter of approaching that stationary state. It's not a matter of finding the best integration time and so on. So, and if you have an energy, then maybe learning the stationary states by the energy might be better. Exactly as for mechanics, right? Where you have 
stationary states or trajectories, if you start considering kinetic terms, as uh, you know, Dominic also was saying, is of course one of the more physics-inspired next direction that was implicit there. You, you know, we can of course look at second-order dynamics if you have mass and therefore velocity and so on. Um, so there's a lot to unpack, I think. But what you said is, I think, definitely the main, at least for, for the purpose of this paper, the main point is trying to give a more controllable approach to how what we learn on, on for genes. Okay. And then for controllable, how do you think we can control beyond hom homophily versus heterophily? That's a good question. And... Uh... So there are, there, there, there are this stuff we're working on, but but the problem, the point is, um, I think in general this paper is looking at the um, is looking at the first two sort of operations you can do on an edge, which is like you attract or you push things away, and this is like okay, it kind of makes sense for it. It, it it's a very it sort of builds on a for sort of easy intuition in terms of homophily, right? Because Similar things should attract, and things that are different should should be pushed apart. But if you think about, for example, about graph level task, then at the end of the day, we are most of the time predicting functional of the configuration, like of the graph, as for example, like their their topology and their features and how the features relate to topology. All these pieces can be encoded in an energy framework. In fact, most of the times. It's an energy that we want to predict in a graph progression task, for example, or some sort of functional of topology and features. So the purpose is getting closer into what we are parameterizing and learning and what we effectively want to predict. Um, I agree that in this paper, we mostly explore it roughly because it's like, it's, it's the first step of operations, but like you may think of something like more, um, complicated for example like something that i mentioned earlier where you have this invariance of operations like stuff that is in the kernel of w is invariant then it's kind of interesting because you can start thinking for example of integrability of what is preserved in the dynamics and this could be used to see because if something is you can look at this in both ways something may be redundant so it's preserved because it's not needed or something is is important is preserved because it's a preserved quantity of the system like it's in an integrable quantity so actually um i'm not saying that structure repulsion are the only things you need but um you can you can see that like by the end we like had to rush to make it an hour so already there is a lot to say if you have like attraction repulsion the framework and the spectral theory and the and even HFT, even high frequency dominant dynamics, this is what I was hinting at in the paper in terms of this result. Existing continuous models like CGNN, for example, continuous graph neural network, they can never be HFT. You cannot learn parameters that can make you the equation driven by the high frequency, for example. So it's not something that you get for granted, um, but, and the role of the residual connection is actually something that we haven't explored in the talk, but it kind of, seems to shed further light on why residual connections help from the point of view of enabling the spectrum of the channel mixing to drive the dynamics in the side of the spectrum of the graph where it matters most. Um, but again, there is no way this is this only makes sense for, for not classification. Um, at the end of the day, like if you're estimating sol sol solubility or something like that, you're estimating functions. Like if you have, you know, say you want to compute the entropy, you're still computing a function of the configuration of, of, of your system, which is, you can think of positions and topology. Um, I think there is a raised hand, maybe we, mm -hmm. you know, we should ask the question first uh, and then yeah. keep going. Francesco. Well, multiple, multiple, Francesco, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you for the work, uh, very interesting and for the presentation. So uh, if I understand correctly, W is trainable and Omega is trainable, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you use small size to work with a large, uh, a large graph. So uh, do I, is it correct that you don't minimize the energy until the end, but you tau is like a hyperparameter? Um, so or... tau, yeah, tau is a hyperparameter, sure. Tau is the step size, so basically, yeah. Oh, okay. 
there's 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 two hyperparameters. There's integration time, which is big T, and tau, which is the step size. But you go until the end. Do you minimize no. the energy until the end? No, okay. no, no. So do you have an idea how far are you from the stationary points? So that's no. a very good question. Um, the answer is the following. So real in in in. in Unless you have a very idealistic heterophilic graph, like, okay, what I mean by ideal heterophilic graph? Ideal heterophilic graph, for example, is like this very stupid bipartite graph where you can take the largest frequency again back to, that's the perfect classifier there. But unless you are in these very ideal corner cases, you're never going to get that a dynamics that is approaching exponentially fast, the lowest frequency space, or exponentially fast, the highest frequency space, is the best classifier. It's never going to be that. And in fact, I think that's that sort of was um, what uh, also James had that, that, that slide about the role of initial condition and integration time. So um, you very generally, and this circles back to Hannes' questions as well, this energy is quadratic. It can induce these two types of operations, attraction or repulsion. What it means is in terms of stationary states, you're going to have two types of stationary states, very, very smooth, very, very not smooth, and nothing in between. There are no very complicated stationary states. This is sort of a consequence of graph convolutional networks in some way. You can kind of tweak it, tweak it a bit with nonlinear activations, but then what you lose is you don't know what you're converging to most, basically. So there are ways of generalizing that and think this is sort of what we are also working on to make the energy more general, still controllable, so that the stationary states you can get out of it are actually interesting so interesting that hopefully you want to converge to that. So you would sort of bypass the problem of choosing the integration time and step sizes, or AKA the number of layers, which is the ratio of integration time and step size. But it's a very good question. Unfortunately, or I mean, fortunately, I don't know. I, I'm not one of these people that like is obsessed about going deeper, like going deeper by preserving the performance. It's not just like, you know, some, some, something like that, that, that is sort of, um, by the def by default is always better and um, it's, so it's, it's a very good so it's like uh, there is a the perfect energy for this task with, yeah uh, that you if you minimize uh but you don't know in advance so okay i understand that, that would that, that would be the hope the hope would be finding an energy whose minimizers are expressive enough but still controllable that can be effective your classifiers so that it's a matter of reaching this class this minimizer effect not the path right how you, yeah. you sort of press but that's that's not easy yeah i have uh, two questions quickly uh, uh so the first is uh, most important is what do you think is your advantage is that you can derive this energy so it's uh, the let's say interpretability of the approach and uh, and the second one is how do you because you 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 have this dynamic and somehow you don't go to the steady state you are in the middle of it uh, so what, what is what is the relation to the kernel graph method where you use the, Lapl the laplacian eigenvalue no to do classification yeah this is my question thank you so very good, very good question. So the first one is uh, interpretability, right? So I think the analogy, the good analogy is image processing, right? So for example, one of, I would say arguably one of the most popular like PD uh, on, on for image analysis, Perona Malik flow. Um, I think this was probably, a, I think derived in the 80s or something as a PD. But then a much, a, a few years later, people realized that actually this partial differential equation was actually a gradient flow of an energy. And that sort of, this was one, the, then there's, there was a whole trend of papers coming out where, for example, for equations used to reconstruct images were derived by functionals that had a very easy interpretation. You take the gradient flow of that, and then you get equations that reconstruct images. So what I'm trying to argue here is, we are not saying in, in this paper you get all the theory and all the results you need to justify that this is by, by default 100% more interpretable. These are definitely first steps, but I think it's mostly giving new lens that one can sort of 
Think of GenEnz, but as for PDs for images or label propagation uh, 15 years ago, one can think of, well, actually, do we have an energy? What if we have an energy? What would be the right energy for my problem? And it's more like shifting the focus. And I think this was quite successful in other fields, and we hope that this is can be successful here as well. But there's a lot of work to do. The second question was about uh, connection to essentially like spectral methods. Um, the main difference is we never compute the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. We never have to resort to spectral decomposition of the Laplacian and then sort of making it more efficient. This is a, a truly message passing framework. It's a spatial method. Um, so there are, of course, it's a trade-off. Spectral method may be in principle more expressive if you control the spectrum directly, but they are way more less efficient. Here, it's a spatial method like GCN or GAT or something like that, but the point would be more, thanks to the energy and this interaction of the spectrum of the graph and the spectral channel mixing, you know a bit better what kind of frequencies at some point will be, dream, will be sort of driving your, your dynamics. But there is a difference. Ours is a spatial, sparse method that scales like number of edges. Thank you. Um, yeah, but Thank very you. good question, actually. Thanks for that. Um, Rito? 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 I don't know how to pronounce your name. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very well. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, I understand, uh, like, much of your paper, like, it's about, like, the dynamics and uh, what to do, like, uh, mechanics and how to do things. But I don't have any intuitions as to how to uh, see energy. Uh, I mean, can you can you give any primers or pointers to that? I mean, how to start thinking about energy in, in concept in related to deep learning and especially graph neural networks? Can you think uh, how do you draw the parallel and how this is homologous or analogous to energy as in sense of physics? Can you can you tell me that? Right. So um let me start, okay, let me ask you a question, and it's fine if, if the answer is no. Do you uh, know or remember how the this paper by Zouet, I don't remember, I never remember the other name, but they, they wanted to do label propagation, how they derive label propagation algorithms in with energies? Otherwise, I can recap that quickly for you. No, no, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. So, okay, so basically, I think this is, to me, is, it's very much the kind of starting point here. Uh, if, if we don't have to go that hard as in PDEs and image, but let's look at graphs. Let's suppose we are looking at semi-supervised settings. So some nodes are labeled, others aren't. We want to predict labels for those that aren't. Now, we are looking at this at simplified setting. This was the main difference. Label propagation was not taken into account features. It was pre-deep learning on graphs, but that's, that's the same analogy. So we have a graph. Then the, the sort of idea of label propagation was, okay, I'm assuming that the graph is homophilic. So nodes that are connected by an edge should most of the time have similar label or same label, sorry. So what I do is I take the Dirichlet energy of the labels of my predicted label, and I want to minimize that. I want something that is smooth. So minimize the Dirichlet energy. But then I also want to take into account that some labels are known. I don't want to sort of override the smoothing process over this node. So I can use this, the nodes I see as boundary conditions or as penalty. Like I want to be close to the nodes, to the labels I have access to, like the training one, for example. Then you, this is now an energy where you have a regularization term and a penalty. You take a minimization of this energy and then you have your label propagation algorithm. Now, in the deep learning era, and when we have features, you can now ask the question, well, what if I don't need to smooth things out? What if I don't need to do regularization? Now, I want to apply the same process, but now the energy might be more general. For example, that pairwise energy I was uh, looking here, maybe I can explain this better with a uh, slide. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. So um, if you look at this, uh, actually, if you look at this energy here, so what it, basically the interpretation is I let my, by that propagation, my model to learn whether, for example, I need repulsion, meaning that along an edge, I don't have necessarily to bring things closer 
I may actually want to separate that. But it's the same principle that was working for label propagation. So you have, instead of thinking about features, you think about particles moving in this uh, latent dimensional space. And then you want to learn how, basically you have two information, the graph, which is giving you via the adjacency who's connected to whom, meaning what's short range interaction. And then you have the potential that you're learning, meaning along an edge, do you want to get closer? Do you want to be pulled apart? But that's, that's very similar to the idea of labor propagation of an energy that controls the particles, right? Uh, makes makes much better sense. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, yeah. Then, if there are no other questions from anyone else, uh, maybe I can come back to mine. All oh, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Yes. So anyway, the thing I was, oh, one more doubt. I had right. You were saying a lot of a lot of functions are actually expressible as gradients of energies, or a lot of dynamics are uh, expressible as gradients of energies. And maybe this is not a relevant restriction. And probably, yeah, it, we won't uh, lose important expressiveness by doing this. But also something that happens, right? If we restrict ourselves to gradients of energies is that just the optimization might come harder of the of our yeah of our function um, we're now parameterizing on the energy and uh, then using the dynamics uh, of that or the the gradient as the dynamics and yeah the dynamics optimizing the dynamics directly would be a lot more direct right and maybe the optimization might be much easier so. um i so the 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 answer is we still don't know that yet but my intuition is actually the opposite so and because if you have a better feeling and understanding of what is actually the uh, the determining factors in your dynamics like for example um so if you have a term that you're parameterizing directly in your equation this is what enters the loss and this is what gets updated by back propagation now there's all then i have a bunch of questions about stability or not with respect to perturbation of these terms which sort of try to be the is a basically how easy is training with respect to this term because if finding the optimal weights are very it's very very like hard so it's very sensitive to perturbation and it's very noisy it's kind of it's harder to train but now if the same effect can be done elsewhere with at the energy level i can have different parameterization because i i know directly what matters for my dynamics so if you have a term that's okay. actually you solve the equation and is actually the term that is the size the deciding who, who wins or not you don't you want to parameterize this term directly because the loss should be able to see this term not via entries of a matrix or something like that i know i'm being very high level because this is something we are actively working on somehow but is is i my intuition is like if you control a lot the loss can be you can choose smarter parameterization where the loss directly controls which is inside sort of inside the equation or the functional and therefore you can be more stable way more stable than than parameterizing agnostically like not knowing what the dynamics is actually doing okay um yeah i'm i'm, I'm not a hundred percent convinced but i see the argument that you're making and maybe uh if you say you're working on it maybe there will be some um concrete insights there at some point and yeah i, I mean I, I don't wanna um the, the honestly i mean um we we are looking for answers meaning that there's like a lot of questions as this paper is as of course raised in our minds and we want to address them and most of, it's good that most of the questions we have are the questions that you're asking of course expressivity behavior with respect to back propagation and parameterization is it better to learn an energy rather than the equation and all of that? These are not easy questions, but the intuition I have is that, um, yes, there's, there's um, 
um, there is a, in my opinion, always a better way of parameterizing equations if you are directly learning what matters and what the energy is telling you that matters for the dynamics. Like if you don't know what's going on, you start, there is a risk of over parameterizing things and, or um, you're making very hard for the loss to sort of control what matters for the equations. Um, so I think it's, it's, that doesn't, this is a different problem from expressivity. So the point of expressive power is one point. The other point is how easily you can train or you can optimize. These are very two di different points are very interesting questions to sort of investigate because once you have a lot of control, these questions arise very naturally. Uh, and and uh, uh, you will need to go a little bit more expressive than quadratic energies for sure. Um, although the paper sort of seems to show that most of the times, at least for these standard node classification tasks, attraction and pulsion may be enough. But of course, you may need more expressive power. Um, I don't see expressivity being a problem, actually. It's more about actually what you gain, what you can gain from. If it's true, actually, that you are you're making the optimization better, maybe the energy will lead to better generalization. At least I have these hopes. And because I'm trusting a lot uh, more physics and, and geometry than deep learning, and they use a lot of energies. So, uh, yeah. but it, there's, um, a lot to, there's a lot to do. You, I'm entirely interested in, in that direction, right? It's almost like the equivariance. Um, yes. Almost like equivariant architectures where you now, maybe you build an architecture that is inherently equivariant and maybe that also fits the, the problem that you're tackling, but maybe it's now also harder to optimize this architecture, even though you've built You're right. I mean, that's you're right. This is the analogy is there. Um, every time you have, like, uh, you can because of course you can think of symmetries in this setting. In general, like you give a graph and you can think of quantities that are now preserved along the equations, like a, a conserved quantities, like in like for Lagrangians. So there is the analogy is there, and for sure, every time you introduce constraints. The problem, the, there are questions that come up, like, are we making the optimization harder? Are we losing too much expressive power? And um, I agree, these uh, are very interesting questions, but I'm, I'm glad that there are such questions because it's like, it means, I think, whenever, if you have sort of like this claim, you know, if you have this idea like that, you know, this is a new angle to look at, you, there, are, there is a road ahead to sort of uh, sustain that. But I feel like this, this paper is, for example, already uh, highlighting something about the that, that was sort of ignored a little bit before, which is this interaction between the channel mix and the spectrum of the channel mix and the spectrum of the Laplace and how this interaction, or to be more precise, how the tensor product of the two is actually what literally is the tensor that governs your dynamics. And, you know, it, it, that you, you, if you want to, like, for example, we never actually did that, but if you want to, for example, um, compute the eigenvalue, the composition of the Laplacian. You can compute precisely the solution, and you can compute even the logits analytically. So everything that goes into so you and so for example, so you have to pay a price, right? You have to compute the eigenvalue, the composition of the graph. But if you do that, for example, integration time becomes a parameter you can learn. You don't have to estimate, tune in over because you have analytic exp expressions. So. It's there is a lot already that that sort of I I believe that this work sort of um, um, provides even if you forget about energy and you start and you only care about the channel mixing and how it affects your dynamics and something also that we were very quick on but it's quite rare to find this analysis with general activations but it's very interesting that even if you activate the gradient flow with like ReLU, TANH or Actan the all these functions here you are still preserving the interpretation. So W still preserves the, still acts as a potential, as attraction or repulsion, the energy is still decreasing. So again, this is not something I, it's something that is relevant because for example, the increased expressive power that you get from nonlinear activations does not come at the price of interpretation. And just, yeah, just a comment about parameter count as well in terms of, Right. Does it make the optimization harder? So because we have a gradient flow, it means you share the weights 
along the evolution. So in a, in a standard GCN, you have different weights at every single layer. On, on the plus side, ours is a very simple model because you can share the weights at every layer. Potentially on the negative side, you have less weights, so you might be less expressive. Then it becomes a trade-off. Potentially you can increase the hidden dimension. So that extra parameter count can go into the hidden dimension instead of having independent weights at each layer. So there, there are different kind of questions to ask. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, having fewer parameters always means like learning, easy, making the... Of course, no, 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 you, you, but... you can make your super complicated architecture with like fewer parameters, but, uh, but the, the architecture we have arguably is quite simple because like, yeah, it's a basically, it's a residual, yeah. it's, it's linear, but uh, we have one question here. Um, link for the label propagation paper. Yeah, there is also another question about, yeah, so um, so there is actually a, uh, this question has been addressed in the paper. Uh, I mean, we didn't have time here to include it in the slides, but um, let me also, let me actually give you the reference for the paragraph, I think is uh, the last paragraph uh, of section four. Yeah, so last paragraph of section four on the archive versus page 12. This is called gradient flow as spectral genetics. And um, this, this basically, it's the, it's the answer to your question. So this is why I, uh, um, I was like, uh, um, I wanted to find a reference. So it's, it's uh, so let me also type. Uh, so that you, you know, for anyone in, interested, um, because there are more, more details and in the appendix as well. But essentially, this paragraph is essentially making precisely a connection to this, to at least some of these works that we reference. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe these are exactly the ones uh, they, uh, you were thinking about. And the, the answer effectively is the following. These works, they try somehow directly to learn negative weights of the graph uh, by a thresholding mechanism or an attention mechanism, something like that. But the idea is they try to learn negative weights. Uh, what this paragraph shows is effectively that once you are in the correct basis in feature space given by the eigenvectors of the channel mixing, so you basically diagonalize the problem, um, in that basis, depending on the sign of the eigenvalues, you are effectively flipping the sign of the edges if you are negatively valued or not. So you don't, what, what, basically, what basically the connection shows is in principle, the channel mixing once you look at the right basis, the diagonalized problem is achieving exactly this sort of ad hoc negative weights uh, reparameterization. So there is a very good connection there. Um, the difference, another difference would be that those paper might, there is a trade-off. So if you wanna learn an operation edgewise, like you want to learn a given edge to be negative and a given edge to be positive and so on and sort of be truly anisotropic, you may be again more expressive. That comes as a price though of sort of computational cost. And we kind of compare at least with one of these math models in our experiments, we, we I think almost always beat them. So again, it's not just a question of being on paper more expressive, but there is a connection there. Uh, we effectively once we diagonalize the problem in the right basis we are learning you can think of that the channel mixing is learning negative eigenvalues by flipping the sign of the edges or reversing the time the time orientation if you like so it's it's there is a connection for sure um it just you do that in different ways we never really control directly the edges or learn some negative weight by hand but yeah this is a good question yeah, let's look forward to the, the next paper that Francesco and the Twitter team puts out. Maybe we'll beat the two hour mark when discussing that, maybe not, but I look forward to it. I hope you do too. And if you want to stay updated about any papers that we cover, the information is in the description with the mailing list or the Slack channel where we announce the stuff. See you.